Hey, what's up, Vibers? Well, join me as we unravel the shocking dark secrets of how our colonial masters wreaked Nigeria in favor of the North. In a Fatherland interview with Harlot Smith, an Oxford graduate who was recruited by the British Colonial Office and was posted to work in Nigeria in the colonial era, Harlot revealed a lot of dark, shocking secrets. What a better way to have the real truth of how the British placed the northern part of Nigeria above any other part or rather how the British government rigged Nigeria in favor of the north. Despite the prevalence of low level of education or rather illiteracy, the British still decided to put the north above every single region in Nigeria. Well, before I roll out the interview for you guys, please, 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 please do me a favor by hitting subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified anytime I drop a new content. Vibes Plus is a channel that's concerned with celebrity gist, trending news, and a little bit of politics. Please don't forget, subscribe to my channel as I promise to bring you more great contents. Without further ado, let me roll the video for you guys to have a look to see how the British colonial masters started corruption and sow a seed for rigging in Nigeria before we even gained independence. Mr. Arrow Smith, welcome Hello. to the program. Hello. And Mrs. Carol Smith, welcome Hello. to the program. Thank you. May I say how delighted we are to be on Passion. We've looked forward to speaking to an African television station for decades. <laughs> this is something we have looked forward to for such a long time, and we are so happy to be here. Thank you. Y Mr. Arrow Smith was a young, bright, and principled Oxford University graduate who was recruited by the colonial office and posted to Nigeria. He took his final, ex uh, final examination a year ahead of his class. He also married Mrs. Carol Smith, whom he met while they were both at Oxford University. Together they went to Nigeria where they had their two children. Mr. Arrow Smith, you were featured in a program uh, recently by BBC Radio 4, yes. uh, titled Document, yes. and that was hosted by Mr. Mike Thompson. Yes. You were alleged that the British government rigged the first and most important election in the history of Nigeria in 1959 in favor of the North. Am I correct? Yes. How long were you in Nigeria for? From 1955 to 1960. And we were based in Lagos. I was on the staff of the Department of Labor. I was largely occupied with employment problems, all the employment exchanges, and statistics and international reports and was kept pretty busy. I was also stationed in Lagos in charge of the capital and the port. I was the port labour officer as well and I also devised a port labour scheme and later a social security scheme which was one of the first in Africa which guaranteed workers some income after they'd finished work. It was a, a Providence Scheme, as I say, it was called the National Providence Scheme, and I was very proud to have put that on the statute book. I was going to ask you what your role is. You've mentioned three important. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular name given to your office while you were there? Just Labour Officer. I was a Labour Officer, a senior civil servant. Okay. I only intended to stay in Lagos initially for two tours of duty. Although because of this conflict with the elections, there, was, uh, there were difficulties, actually government wouldn't let me leave the civil service they were determined that I should stay in the civil service after my two tours. And I was offered very considerable incentives, including a knighthood, to stay and work for government. Primarily this was because I had access to the state secrets. I learned, and the Governor General himself confirmed this to me, that the elections were rigged, contrived. 
the intention was that the North should rule Nigeria. Even in 56, the Northern leaders were very proud and were saying, if they couldn't run Nigeria, never mind elections. They might not join Nigeria, they might leave. And we all thought, well, how would they survive? There were no industries, there was not a great deal of agriculture, some groundnuts in the north. This wasn't very practical at all. And then it was, the Governor General seemed to be thinking that the north couldn't, even if it won an election, rule Nigeria by itself. The, the south wouldn't stand for that. So there had to be a partner, either the Igbos in the east or the Yoruba in the west, to team up with the north. What he didn't want was for the two southern parties, the Igbo and the Yoruba, to team up to form the government, because he believed the North wouldn't tolerate that and talked about leaving the Federation. So as I learned, in a small way at first, but very rapidly I learned about the election fixing, and as I say, this was confirmed to me by the Governor-General. He actually said that he wanted me to know the truth because he wanted me to know how much trouble I was in. You mentioned statistics, you were collecting figures. Yes. Is that for labor and unemployed people only or generally? Prim primarily, but obviously my interest was in the population of generally. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Yes. And a Wallowo, the Yoruba leader, leader of the action group, yep. and Chief Enahoro, they too, other people were saying, where are all these millions of people in the north? Where are they? We're going up there to campaign. We want to know, you know. And um, you see all these, you know, thousands of miles of not very developed countryside, and yet the northerners are claiming that... Uh, their voting registration figures are larger than in the south, you know, larger, far more people up there. Well, actually, if you went through the Igbo land, you know, Enugu and that, you saw lots and lots of people. If you went to Ibadan, uh, again, Ibadan teeming, you know, with millions of people, but we didn't actually see many northerners, and obviously not many northerners at that time came to Lagos. So this did arouse suspicion. Now, the Europeans, you know, not stupid, we are watching what's going on in Nigeria. And we too are beginning to feel there's something not quite right here, that maybe the elections are not going to be as straightforward as they're meant to be. Nigeria was being described as the showcase of democracy. And it was expected that the nationalist leaders would win through. But actually, when the election results were uh, announced by the Governor General, before the vote was even in, he didn't vote, didn't count for that, he didn't wait for that. I have to tell you, the British were counting the votes. And the British cannot be trusted. They look after their friends. Loyalty is the big thing for the British. And we were friends with the emirs of the north. We looked on people like Inaharo and Awolowo as rather dangerous people. They might even be communists. That was ridiculous, actually. They couldn't mm. be communists in a thousand years. But this was a sort of thing that was being said. And we were, as Europeans, were getting a bit worried about all this. It wasn't quite the honest, straightforward election that we were hoping for. Apart from uh, Professor Anderson and Dr. Patrick Wilmot that supported your submission on the rigged election, there were other people who also served in the colonial office uh, in your days. I mean, who opposed to this uh, submission? There initially, I was um, uh, warned of what was going on by my senior officer, a major bunker. I didn't know, and I knew that uh, the Governor General had directed me to take all the office staff of the Ministry of Labour to help Chief Okoti Ibo in politicking in Wari. And this was most irregular, and I 
refuse to do this. Having refused an order, I know what the drill is. You resign. I resign my post. That is the proper thing to do. What they did then was rather devious. They persuaded me to withdraw my resignation, and when I did, they sacked me. It didn't go through, but they, I thought this was a bit low after I'd resigned and was prepared to leave the country. This was not very nice behaviour. They later withdrew this and said that I had been of some service to the state and actually commended me for what I had done and said I would, could leave Nigeria with splendid testimonials and we shook hands on this. And this was done with the recognition of the Deputy Governor General, Sir Ralph Gray. And then I left Nigeria the first time and took up a job as a personnel officer, a very big job, with the SO refinery. And then government came after me, declared that I was a traitor, and I had betrayed the British people, ought to be imprisoned, and I lost that job. And then they came to me again and said, it's all been a big mistake, dreadful mistake. I'm a jolly decent chap, you know, Oxford chap. And they put me on a plane straight back to Nigeria where I'd make up for the time I'd been away. There was a great deal of good work for me to do. And we fell for this. We shouldn't have gone back, but we did. Now, um if you recall what you said about the role of the governor general and the attitude of the British government in particular uh, regarding the fear that Awolowo, Okutiebo and the lot of them from the south are dangerous, is there a particular reason? Is there, why, why the fear from the British government? Is it that they don't want to release or relinquish Nigeria? No. They still want to they control wanted. Nigeria? They knew that the North would do as they said after independence. If it had any, pro the North would just, because it was their habit, they were, they liked the British, whereas the nationalists were an unknown factor. Actually, on the, when they took the flag down and hoisted the Nigerian flag, not one of the major nationalist politicians was there. They weren't even on the platform. This was incredible. These were the people who had sought independence. The people in the north didn't want independence. They didn't want the British to leave. So this was a farce. And for most Europeans who were very close and watching this, we were disgusted. We thought this really had been manipulated, this election. It was unworthy. It was unworthy of the British people, this. This was no honest, straightforward thing that you would expect Britain, the mother of parliaments, to do. This was cheap and low and criminal. And I opposed it. And I opposed it then and I've opposed it ever since. And I'm telling you the truth. And I was warned, if I told you this, this state secret, my life could be forfeit. Earlier on, you said the British government wanted the not in alliance with either of the southern uh, yes. uh, region, either with the Yorubas or with the Yibos. But I mean, with, with, without which they yes, cannot they, they can't do this rule the country. The problem was that a Wallowo was a highly principled man. Okay. You didn't talk to a Wallowo about squalid deals and fixing things. A Wallowo was not that kind of person. If you read his books, this man was a world statesman, and his young lieutenant, Chief Enaharo, was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. However, they did do a deal with Zik, Dr. Azikawe, okay. from the East. Dr. Azikawe, there was this big problem in Nigeria, it's the same big problem in America and in Britain, how do you get funds to fight elections? The candidates in Nigeria had no money, but they did have marketing boards. 
which were a kind of semi-nationalised industry. And they borrowed money from the marketing boards. But there was a suspicion that Dr. Azikaway, who has formed his own bank, the African Continental Bank, was actually bankrupt. But he was borrowing very large sums of money from the marketing boards and not necessarily repaying the, the loans. Mm. We knew this. We had a great secret service. All the politicians' phones were tapped. All the politicians' mail was opened. Everything that any major politician did in Nigeria, we knew in powers. We watched. We knew all that was going on. Are you saying, in essence, that Dr. Azikwe took money? He was blackmailed by the British to do our bidding. We told Dr. Azikwe that he could go to prison if, if an inquiry was carried out into his bank and his financial circumstances. However, we would not want to be vindictive if Dr. Azikwe was cooperative in helping forward the plans that we had made in the best interests of Nigeria. Dr. Azikwe has nothing in common with the northern politicians. He practically he loathed the northern politicians. But Dr. Azikwe went north and did as he was told. And what he was promised was this. The real power, effective power, would be in the hands of the northern emirs. However, it would look great if the president was Dr. Azikwe and he was given a field marshal's uniform and an admiral's uniform. He asked, please, could he have a row of medals? For, but they said, well, no, that wasn't, that was a bit difficult, you know, to get the medals. So when the ambassador started arriving, he was known to be asking people from foreign countries, you know, perhaps they had a medal <laughs> for his uniform. We thought this was terrible, but it was said that this happened. He was very vain. And he, for a time, he functioned as the, first the governor general, and then when Nigeria became a republic, as the president. But he had no power. And when he did try to tell the army, he said, I'm the field marshal, the army has got to do with this. They said, hey, you're just a ceremonial figure. You have no power. The prime minister, Belewa, gives us our orders. So there was a feeling then that there was going to be trouble. And then it was because the Awolowo and the action group had become the official opposition. What we British wondered, how could they win another election without the British counting the votes? There could not be another a proper run election without, without us there. We knew what we were doing. We were just helping things along. You know, we were doing what the British do favouring our friends and looking after our own and repaying favours. We don't call that corruption. Right. I mean, in essence, what Dr. Azikwe did, he was forced by the British government to do it, yes. collecting money from the marketing board then. Yes. So if any, po any politician here in the United Kingdom tried to do that, be in jail. It will be in jail. So why did the British government refuse to take action? Because or comment on if we nipped it in the bud, because we knew it was happening. It was even happening in. Let me be fair. In the West, with the Wallowo, they were taking some money. They meant to repay it, perhaps, but they were taking money. And I would have said, issue a warning now and say, you know, you've got to behave. Because if this is allowed to go on, it will be a major offence. However, before they actually ran the 1959 election, they needed money for the North 
and for the NCNC, Dr. Zick, to fight the election. So what they did, my senior officer, Major Bunker, went around, was ordered by the Governor General to go to all the major British firms and international firms, Ford, UAC, Leventis, all these firms, and raise money for a slush fund to enable Chief Okota Ibo, together with the North, to fight the 1959 elections. The North got most of their money from the native authorities. This was looked on by the British as being okay. This wasn't corrupt because we were friends of the North. And if they tried this in the West or in the East, we might have said this was corruption. But because it happened in the North, the native authorities, public money, was poured into the government party, the NPU. So this obviously was a, a, a terrible fiddle. We were discriminating against the southern politicians in favour of these northern emirs. What we saw was that the, this would not be the first act of treachery. They would have to smash the action group because the action group was strong and in a, 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 new, a fresh election they would be sure to win. They were pretty honest and regular guys and a lot of the British quite admired uh, Awolowo for his brain power and they admired Chief Anahro as a bit cheeky and young and spirited and they were both um, quite admired you know as they were like right-wing Labour people, not, nothing mm. revolutionary. Mm. And so a great deal of money was raised by my senior officer, Major Bunker, before the 1959 election. And this was money put up by United Africa, by Ford, Shell, BP, and my wife, who was the personal assistant to the general manager of BP Nigeria, she's not going to tell you anything because she was a confidential secretary. I can only tell you that we were very well informed on some of the hanky-panky that was going on in Lagos. Having revealed now that the election of 1959 was rigged, the census figure were cooked, I don't know if you have been following the uh, ongoing in Nigeria today. Yes, of course. The last general election, yes. the 1979-1980 election, I mean, in which uh, Azekwe was the beautiful bride. And, uh, I mean... But the I have to tell you, sir, that I'm not going to comment. Okay. I cannot interfere in Nigeria's domestic politics. I'm a historic figure. I do keep up, naturally, because I love Nigeria. And I've kept up with its history of its assassinations and coup, military coups and dictatorships for 50 years. And this has been one of the biggest tragedies in world history because this potentially was one of the greatest nations on earth. Yeah. Nigeria was packed with educated, decent people who wanted to serve their country. Since you lost that job that the, uh, the government uh, threatened or went behind you mm -hmm. to say that you were disloyal to them and you were fired. Have you ever worked any other place since? Have I? Have you worked in any other company yes. since? I didn't uh, go to Oxford in the usual way. I came from a very poor family and left school when I was 13 years old and I served a factory apprenticeship as an engineer which is very unusual for an Oxford undergraduate. At Oxford also, I trained as a social worker. I'm a fully qualified social worker. So although, and as a personnel officer too, although the government stopped me working when I returned to this country and I was quite ill, I did a lot of voluntary work from this time on both in the medical field, in the field of young girls, 
We also had campaigns on comprehensive schools. So I've kept very busy over the decades, although I have been kept out of employment quite deliberately. And when I did take up work, the government came after me and behaved abominably. And they did the most appalling things. They framed me with money missing. When I, I worked as a humble postman, after I'd worked as a personnel officer, I delivered the post to, to the workers who I'd employed. And they forced me out of that. They framed me. And later, when I was working in a labour exchange, they used the foulest methods to get me out of work. They told me they would. They said, the Governor General said, unless you do what I say, you will never work again. And he offered me this, and it's very big bribes, a knighthood, a post in the Far East, in the Foreign Service, and a large sum of money. And this was confirmed later in Whitehall, and we turned it down. Thank you very much for uh, your time to answer some of the questions we've posed to you. Uh, what would be your advice to the Nigerian audience watching us now? They have potentially one of the greatest nations on earth. What they have to do is be disciplined. And they've got to unite together and love each other, be kind to each other. Like they are, they're great to their own families. Nobody has nicer families and children than Nigerians. All Nigerians love their own family. They've got to extend that family to include their neighbours okay. and the other peoples in the Federation. Uh, we really appreciate your coming around. The all Nigerians here in the uh, United Kingdom and Nigeria who are likely going to watch this um, interview as well, we want to say thank you very much. We welcome you and uh, we wish you God building as you go back. Give our love and appreciation to all your peoples. Thank you. We very love you. Thank you. Mrs. Carol Smith, we were unable to ask you a question, but we know that uh, you are with us all the way. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Vibers, this is really, really, really deep. Now I have a better understanding. I believe you to have a better understanding on why this country is finding it very hard to unite as a region of this country actually sees itself as the heir to the throne while a region of this country is being seen as willing to... <sighs> this is really confusing well head to the comment section and drop your take drop your view let's have a discussion there let's talk what do you think is the way forward for nigeria is it to actually split or to find a way and reform this country because with this revelation i'm seriously confused i understand why our biafra brothers always have it in mind that they are being marginalized and this is not a lie I now understand better. Please head to the comment section. Let's have a conversation. But before you leave, please help me in subscribing. Hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell so that you get notified anytime I drop a new content. That will give me the firepower to keep bringing good contents like this. Do have a lovely time. Peace. And God bless you as you hit that subscribe button.